Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Socrates Streams, and I am your host, Socrates. Uh, I am looking at some charts today about one hour before the weekly close in Bitcoin. Uh, so this full episode will be um, in the time leading up to when that candle closes. I do have a number of things that I'll be wanting to talk about um, outside of the um, shorter term stuff that we have been looking at on the four hour chart. Uh, today we will start to um, focus a little bit more on some higher time frame stuff. Uh, if we do have time uh, towards the end, we'll get uh, take a look at the open in the gold market. It has had a big open uh, this afternoon. And uh, so I guess without anything more being said, we'll go ahead and send it on screen share. <clears throat> and pull up a chart. Um, so definitely seeing some very important action uh, as it is leading into the weekly close. There is a uh, trend line that the price is threatening to break down and just any time that it looks like it's getting ready to break down this trend line, there's been a big reaction to the upside when it has failed to do so. We're seeing a lot of wicks coming off of this area. No closes below this area. And um, just a couple minutes ago, I mean maybe 15 minutes ago, this thing was a full red body that opened right here and had dumped down, taken out these lows, and really looked like it was potentially ready to take out this trend line um, going into that weekly close, which was something that I was um, going to be, I guess, a little bit hoping for based on the positions that I am holding, which are short this market, and uh, have been just kind of liking what I'm seeing over the last 24 hours or so, uh, but that could just change absolutely in the blink of an eye. I'm um, seeing this long wick coming off of this trend line after it really tried to break it down but failed to do so is um, a very important sign for the uh, bullish perspective. The, more we've tried to break this down, the more we've just bounced when it failed to do so. Um, so we'll definitely be keeping my eye on that. Um, again, I am starting out with some of the shorter time frames because those change so quickly, and then we'll zoom out to the higher time frames looking for confirmation or potentially a different story being told. Um, did get a bit of a Darth Maul candle in here. That's um, something that will have a big extended wick on the bottom and on the top. You'd like to see this a little bit closer to the middle, but essentially um, just view this as a little bit more bearish opposed to neutral, where the bearish wick is more pronounced than the bullish wick. And of course you have the bearish close. Um, so was interested to see that that ran all the way up, failed to break through this parabolic SAR, and then quickly retraced back down below the 50, creating another lower high below this area here, and another potential um, Williams fractal that would be coming off of this candle. We have a high, lower high, lower high, lower high, lower high. Um, so could be getting another fractal printing on the upside, which would just show that, yes, we have lower highs, lower highs, lower highs, and that are met with higher lows, higher lows, and potential for another higher low above this area. So lower highs and higher lows, we should recognize that as a symmetrical triangle. Something like this. Interesting how that wick came right up to that as well. I didn't have this drawn in real time. This is in hindsight. The reason why I'm connecting it to that wick is because I want to make sure that this doesn't close above and then getting this touch point here. Um, I was trying to make it touch here, but that just didn't work. Uh, let's see if we bring it down to there. Now we've got this close above 
So this to me is preferable. We catch this wick, this wick's above, full body below, catches this wick. Um, let's see here, starts at the top of here. Maybe we can even make it a little bit better by moving it to this peak here and then it cuts through this candle that gives us one more candle to cut through uh, and then come down and you see how this ran right up and found some resistance right around there I think it was more perfect before I made that last adjustment let's see um, yep so that's probably how I would leave it um, so just definitely uh, something to be paying close attention to higher lows and lower highs, symmetrical triangle consolidation pattern. The overall trend is definitely bullish. This thing is definitely in an uptrend. And when you consolidate in an uptrend, the most, what you should expect most like most of the time is for it to break in the direction of the preceding trend. Um, these triangles are points of confusion. They are areas where the price gets to cool off after making a big move. And um, if we had a flat base, that would be a descending triangle, which is bearish and would indicate reversal. Uh, but since we have higher lows in combination with the lower highs, that gives us this symmetrical triangle, which is what I would consider a neutral pattern that should be, um, that in and of itself is neutral, but is not neutral once you consider the preceding action. Um, just looking at a symmetrical triangle, that's neutral, but if I look at the full action before, I would expect that this breaks in the direction of the preceding trend. Now that's not what I've been saying over the last couple days, and um, that's because this is just considering if we're just looking at this as a symmetrical triangle and we're not really looking at anything else. Um, so just based on this pattern here, uh, support here and a break to the upside does seem like the most likely, but there are a number of other reasons why I do not believe that that is the most likely um, way that the price is going to move from here. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at that uh, parabolic pattern that is coming in on the highs and the lows and giving us a bit of a, um, what I was calling a Jesus fish pattern uh, that has been a very important boundary as well on the um, top and the bottom. So let's see that it is continuing to support that bottom end. Now let's take a look up in here. Something do like so. I guess we'll do like so. And there we go. Okay, so this is definitely a pattern that I have been, um, you know, just paying attention to in terms of it's not a traditional stock market pattern that you'll find from um, Edwards and, and McGee or um, Shaw Baker or um, more recent uh, Peter Brandt. Uh, you'll, you'll never see those guys. Uh, this isn't a pattern that they consider as a classical chart pattern, and is not, obviously, but it is um, something that illustrates important boundaries to me. Uh, let's go ahead and move this a little bit like that so we get those in there. Um, so just notice how in very volatile markets, often you'll get parabolic moves, where instead of a trend line, the best fit is a curving line. And when you are drawing a parabola, um, this wouldn't qualify because you don't want this first part of it to have a negative slope. Um, to try to put that in a little bit easier terms, uh, if you're drawing a parabolic curve, you want to make sure that you see how this first part, it goes negative, it goes down. You don't want that. You want it to be... Um, basically not have a negative slope. 
so if we kind of pull it down like that we see how there's no longer a negative slope for that um, so that is an important rule for drawing these uh, parabolas and something that would basically disqualify how this is drawn because it does have a negative slope um, but this is what let's go ahead I forgot to blow this guy up uh, let's go ahead and take a look at button bottom trading And hopefully this doesn't take me forever to pull up. And of course it looks like it will. Son of a gun. Uh, let's try an ascending skeleton. Okay, it looks like this is going to have a little bit more what I want. Um, so here, let's see if we can get this any bigger. <clears throat> so this would be from Thomas Bulkowski's chart pattern. Um, and geez Louise, can they make that any smaller? Like seriously? Okay, let's do... Okay. So here we have kind of the ascending scallop um, where you have this big kind of down move that makes this sort of cupping bottom uh, where maybe you end up getting a bit of a cup and handle, maybe you don't. Uh, you look for this and then this horizontal right here as the confirmation to go ahead and enter. So. Uh, button bottom or an ascending scallop. Uh, I, I call those two the same thing. They may not be, but I think they pretty much are. And that's kind of what we're seeing here, especially if I was to come up in here and then we do this. And then um, probably this would be my confirmation, even though it does look a little bit funky. This ideally would have stayed below here, um, below 11,000, this guy. And then you kind of get this flat, resistance and this um, ascending what's kind of like an ascending triangle but it's a little more so because you have this rounded um, beautifully rounded bottom um, so that is something that I always pay close attention to and then what happens when you get the same thing on the top where it's this kind of rounding top uh, that's very much a parabola and I am so we are still seeing that price has very much respected uh, this line that connects all of these, I mean, this is the best fit line as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the trend line just don't work as well uh, because it's a more of a curving, more of a French curve, and uh, same with the bottom. So this is something, like I said, I've seen um, multiple times before, but I've never seen anybody else talk about and actually have a cool comment to share from the uh, comment section the other day from uh, Hai Jin Lee, who is somebody that I respect very much, one of the top Elliott Wave practitioners, and Elliott Wavers are really, really some of the top um, pattern traders as well, in my experience. Um, so I have a lot of respect for Hai Jin. Uh, I had no idea that he might be watching uh, one or, or more of these episodes, so if you're still out there uh, watching, how's it going, Hai Jin? Uh, thank you very much for tuning in and for or chiming in in the comments uh, saying yuck 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 Jesus fish pattern exclamation point I've never heard of that beautiful <laughs> so I've uh, got definitely a bit of a kick out of that um, uh, like I said I had, had uh, it didn't surprise me that he'd never heard of that because I'd never seen anybody else talk about it and that is very cool to see that maybe he's kind of seeing the same sort of thing that I'm seeing in terms of this isn't just a you know a, a goofy um, pattern that you draw and then put a moon next to it and you know magnets and arrows and and all that sort of stuff which a lot of people like to do to get attention maybe he was seeing that no this this maybe these these boundaries really are relevant and once one of them breaks down watch for the price to continue respecting um, the the other one so 
Okay, um, that is the patterns. Uh, we'll go ahead and look at all these uh, head and shoulders that we're getting again. Um, so now we're kind of getting into the reasons why I'm expecting this to break down. Let's just do little little head here and little shoulder here. And then we got ourselves a nice shoulder here. And now we could potentially go big head. And then big shoulder. And a big shoulder. Now this one, the big one isn't ideal because this, this is kind of weird. Like really I'd want this action right here because um, this is like an Adam and Eve. You got the clear V and Eve. Um, so this isn't, the shoulder should be more up like this, like this action here. Um, but uh, I'm comfortable calling this the uh, shoulder because the horizontals line up so nicely. You get the spike uh, kind of consolidation. Um, the one thing that it definitely leaves to be desired is I, I would want a flat area for the neckline. That shows support being tested and being eaten away at. When we have higher lows, it still can qualify, but it's much less um, potent in my opinion because instead of continuing to come down and test horizontal, we're finding higher lows, higher lows, higher lows. Um, so this would be the neckline uh, right here for the head and shoulders, um, which is not horizontal, which makes it slightly less ideal, but still um, it closed below this area. Notice how the smaller head and shoulders that is a horizontal neckline. So if we close below there, um, I'm going to say 98.86 on BitMEX, 98.79. I'm always a little conservative, so I'd say 98.74 on BitMEX, uh, depending on what time frame you trade, maybe like the 12 hour, so looking for a 12 hour close below there. I'm a four hour guy, um, so I'd look for the lowest four hour close since this neckline has started to establish itself. Really, you would say it's right here, I would think, at 98.74, basically just where I was looking. Um, but seeing this sharp reaction here and this wick kind of here, I may be looking for further confirmation if we closed kind of above here and below here. Um, maybe I'd be waiting for that 12 hour or just looking for this for a close below here just to make it a little bit more conservative, 97.55. Um, and uh, let's see here. I think yesterday probably lined out the potential trade in terms of a close below there. I would be putting my stop at above 10,500 and targeting about a return to 8,000 for around a four to one risk reward ratio. Not saying that any of you should do that. I'm just telling you that this is a setup that I am seeing that I would be interested in taking. We could uh, zoom in even a little bit more and see even another kind of smaller head, shoulder, shoulder. It really looks like uh, this thing is wanting to confirm this head and shoulders. But if we just continue to fail to close below this line and we continue to get these bounces, I mean, then that could take out every single one of these and send us uh, right back onto the upside. So I've been saying this for the last few days and I have meant it and I've pretty much been right for the most part in that now it's time to be paying very, very close attention because this thing can rip hard in one direction or the other. Uh, once it decides where it wants to move, it's going to be ready to really make a strong move. And when analyzing Bitcoin, there's often the case where a $500 move in Bitcoin is completely irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. Uh, that is couldn't be further from the case right now. $500 move in the price in Bitcoin from here should cause for a 20% follow through in that direction. And that is what I firmly believe. Um, again, you got to figure out what you believe for yourself, but this is what I believe is if we break through 10,500, um, we should definitely get back up to 12,500. Um, if we break down 
down 97, 95, then I'm expecting a return to 8,000. Uh, so a $500 move in either direction from here is hugely important to me and kind of illustrated with that Jesus fish pattern that we were looking at. We were really coming to the, the, the apex, the, I guess the, the behind <laughs> of the fish and it's either going to dump or, or continue to the upside um, would be what I would expect is one of those parabolas to um, hold and and then cause for that big move in the opposite direction and there uh, excuse me a big move in the direction that it breaks um, and there just isn't much more room for that thing one of those parabolas is going to have to break soon and um, once one of those breaks, the other one should take over and send us for a, a good solid 20% move. So this is where I want to be paying very, very close attention. Um, and often will be where people use the um, ADX, and, uh, excuse me, that's where people will use the Bollinger Band. And I do not myself um, because I get all the information I need from the ADX for the most part. And I try to try to keep things as minimal as possible. If I've got two indicators, that both can tell me the same thing that I'm just going to try to um, not really look at both because that can get really confusing. Um, so one thing that I look for in terms of think about a Bollinger Band super squeeze, that means the market is really consolidated into a very tight range, is made, ready to make a really big move one way or the other. You don't really know which move it's going to be. Um, how I look for that with the ADX is lows in the ADX. Um, think about if we're below 20, that indicates we're in a range. If we go below 20 for just a little bit and then pop back up, okay, we just range for a little bit and then continue to trend. Well, what if we stay below 20 for a long time? And then what if we refuse to get back above 20? Um, like say, like back in here, we got way down here and then we didn't get back above, now we got way down here. This shows me the same thing as a Bollinger Band super squeeze, or at least a Bollinger Band squeeze, um, where we've spent a lot of time in a range and we are at historical limits. Basically, look at how hard it is for the ADX to get below this area. Therefore, you expect a trend to occur and to occur soon. Um, so even though this ADX hasn't found support, can't forget to call my mom later. Myself a note one second. It is Sunday. Uh, everybody out there, if you haven't talked to your mom, uh, you know, give her a call and wish her a happy Sunday. Uh, okay, so notice how we're not necessarily all the way down here at support, um, but we do see that it started to turn back up. Uh, so that is, this just tells me, um, I just, I, I like this much more than the Bollinger Band. Um, it just works better for me. I know that a lot of people use Bollinger Band very well, but for me, um, when it starts to get close and to squeeze, you don't really know um, how much more may it squeeze if it's not all the way at its extreme limit. Like if it's, all right, I'm just gonna pull something up uh, to make it a little bit easier to explain one second. Uh, so instead of the Bollinger Band, what I would generally use is the Bollinger Band width. That tells us just essentially how wide are the bands. Like visually, you can see when they're really wide and tight, but this shows uh, much better in terms of how tight is, is tight and how wide is wide. Like back here, you might think that these things are really wide, but then you see, holy cow, it can get a lot wider than that. Um, so basically, when you are coming down and you're squeezing and you are kind of approaching extremes, um, but you aren't at them, this doesn't do near as good of a job as telling me when we might be ready to make a move. And this is actually a perfect example. I'm glad I pulled it up. Um, so just take this out of here for a second. So notice how both say that we're not at extremes. The Bollinger Band width um, doesn't get to extremes until like, yeah, we'll say 0.03. Um, and the ADX gets extremes down here about 8.5. So both say that we're not quite at extremes, which doesn't tell you much information. Um, and the AD, uh, the Bollinger Band has, I guess it's kind of, it's just flattened, that width. It hasn't started to expand, um, it's just flattened. And it won't start to expand until a big move happens, whereas we notice that this is showing us more information. It's, it, it has started to actually roll up, opposed to just being flat. Um, so that just goes to show that sometimes 
indicators will be very, very, very useful for a lot of different things, and um, sometimes two will be like one person will just like one better than the other. It doesn't mean it's it's better or worse. It's just I I just prefer um, the ADX, and since I use it for so many other things, um, it does help me to. Um, just keep things simple and not have to refer to a whole bunch of indicators. Uh, so I did start at the top of the hour talking about how much time we're going to spend looking at the higher time frames, and we will definitely get there, but there's just too much to talk about here. Um, this four-hour candle is hugely important, and that's why I did want to come on live right here. The hour leading into the weekly close and the hour following are probably the most important time periods for me. Um, think about the traders that are trading the weekly chart. They're waiting for the weekly close and they're trading these big time frames. Often traders are trading big time frames have big bankrolls. Um, it's just a lot easier to move in and out of positions on the weekly chart than it is the five minute. If you're trading a five minute chart with a five million dollar bankroll, that's a whole lot harder um, you know, than if you're trading the weekly, especially in a market that you know isn't that liquid. So Think about um, the guys that are really starting to make some moves right around now, this hour before and after the weekly close, even maybe two, three, four hours after the close. Um, in my opinion and in my experience, these are some big players that are coming in and uh, moving around some big money uh, based on what they're seeing. And that's when I pay very close attention for follow through. Like there might be some guys who are just really licking their chops at longing um off of this, you know, what for whatever reason, and now we come in, and all of a sudden we see a big buying pressure start to kick in, which is exactly what happens. All day I've been watching this price melt down, melt down, just kind of roll over, look very bearish, get below this trend line for a little bit, and then boom, out of nowhere it starts to pop about an hour and a half before the weekly close. So pay very close attention to that. Um, it, it's either a trap or it's something real, and that's you can only tell as more time goes on and as you have more experience because often um, there will be a, a counter move right around the closes that occurs before the big break off breakdown happens. Uh, so I'm rambling a little bit, but this is something that I will be paying close attention to and I can't really share too much information probably until four hours after the close until I see what happened. Did we did we come up here and resist and then after the candle closed, dump hard? Did we rally hard right through 10,140 uh, 10, after the candle closed? Those two things um, would paint a very, very, very different picture. And the one thing that I did want to check as we're seeing this action here is what's happening with the DIs. Um, so this is very interesting. We have the ADX starting to roll up, and even though the price has rallied, uh, how much is that? Two percent in the last 30 minutes uh, to an hour, the price has rallied, and look at what's happened with the DIs. They're getting more and more bearish. Uh, this is painting a pretty interesting picture in terms of this is showing that we could be getting ready to trend. This is showing that buying pressure is decreasing. This is showing that selling pressure is increasing. So as price has been rallying, there has been more people selling than there have been buying, which can be very, very counterintuitive. Um, and that's something that you need to. Um, for me, I can only really pick up on when I'm watching the order books. Like um, when, when we were selling, what kind of volume were we coming down on? Were we selling like were the sell orders a hundred thousand and a million dollar orders, and then the buy orders only ten thousand and fifteen thousand? Like sometimes the the amount of the order is for the one side of the trade is so much less than the other uh, that you will um, be able to kind of see what is happening here just by watching the order books in terms of if every time that somebody sells it's only for one contract and every time somebody buys it's for 10 contracts, um, then you will get a very different picture than if it was the other way around. And um, that is even something that when you hear people talking about whale games, there's absolutely bots out there that will be, um, say, if somebody's wanting to sell right here and they've got a $10 million position that they're wanting to get out of right here. So what they do is they first 
start flooding the market with very small buy orders and then getting people to kind of FOMO in once you see this first little bounce. And now the whole way up, he's had a, a million dollar order for sale here, a million dollar order for sale here, a million dollar order for sale here. So he's been really, um, the sell pressure has been persistent. The more we've gone up, maybe even the more the, those orders have increased. So a million here, two here, three here, four here. That's kind of what this is showing me is that the price has moved up. There has been um, supply increasing and demand decreasing. And when this moves against the price, that's something I pay very close attention to. Um, so if that didn't make sense, maybe listen to it a, a time or two again, because um, that is something that is fairly common in terms of the price moves up on selling pressure and understanding how that is possible um, can be um, pretty important in terms of seeing that one hour before the weekly close we're getting a significant move and I'm wondering is this just kind of a, a fake out to um, gain liquidity for the big sellers or is this something that is real this tells me that this is a fake sort of move um, but we have to wait and see, give it another hour, two, or three, to because these can, again, flip around in the blink of an eye as well. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at what else we've got. One other thing on this chart, and then we will be zooming out to the weekly. Remember I mentioned how the RSI can be a bit of a leading indicator in terms of if you're looking at a threshold um, that is in danger of breaking down to keep an eye on the RSI as a bit of a leading indicator. So seeing that it is below 50 is on the bearish side. And then seeing that it did find support here is interesting. Just a little bit ago that was below but didn't close below, so that's all that matters. We could zoom in just a little bit to see that this did come down below, but that would have to be adjusted for a lower time frame, seeing to count for these. So nothing's happened there on the RSI just yet, uh, but something to definitely keep an eye on. At least I know I will be. Notice the oh, ADX rolling over. Uh, that has been a very good way to spot uh, medium to long-term corrections. Notice the buying pressure is decreasing, selling pressure is increasing. Uh, back here, they were a little bit closer, but not too much uh, different. And notice how the buy signal came right in here, right before that big candle. You had the buying pressure uh, really start to pick up, which again, volume can be a leading indicator very much so. Um, so that's why it is important to pay attention to what this is doing um, even before the, even while it looks like the price is doing nothing like it did right here. Okay, so the candle close let's see what we're looking at we've got 20 minutes before the close so some still could happen that's why um, and I probably should have clarified but wanted to save the close until the end of the show um, because that's when it will actually be closed I don't want to give some bunk analysis uh, just because I'm 20 minutes ahead of time so let's go ahead and look at some other charts real quick um, while we're waiting for that thing to close not a good open on the S&P futures uh, definitely did not want that low to get taken out, and it did. Uh, doesn't look like we're going to get a good close. Look at the ADX crossing 20. I bet we're going to see a spread in these designs. What I don't want to see, oh my gosh, holy cow. That is something to pay very close attention to. I mean, that is a huge move in terms of there was a lot of demand right here and excuse me a lot of supply and no demand uh, this is um, when you have the ADX crossing 20 and the DI's close to each other um, like right in here that doesn't really tell us much it's not a good signal you wait for the DI's to diverge notice like how they're diverging here before the big move happens and here they really that didn't happen because I guess a lot of people probably were kind of panicking a little bit is is what I'd see there and just 
selling the shit out of this breakdown here. Um, so seeing the ADX crossing 20 and a huge divergence in the um, DIs is a very strong signal. One that would have signaled a sell on this candle here. And basically what I was looking for was taking out this low here. That, that S&P is not looking good. Um, I think there might be some inversions in the yield curve. Um, that is certainly something to look at. Go ahead and take a look at this um, longer term charts. And I have been worried about this market for one very specific reason. Um, and that is we did take out the weekly SAR on this move. I very much like here, we had a nice rally. We got a chance to correct. Um, right here, I very much would have wanted us to support above the SAR if we were going to create a higher low and stay bullish. We still can create a higher low and stay bullish, but it's not looking great. Um, it's time to pay close attention to this market as well. That's for darn sure. Watch for a close below the 50-week. Watch for these lows to get taken out. Um, definitely watch for this low to get taken out. Um, certainly have stop losses in place for all positions. If I, if I were you, I would absolutely not be in this market without stop losses in every single position. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> That's not always the case. Sometimes when you have a very strong trend, like right now I don't have stop losses set on my gold positions uh, because um, I have a very good idea of where I'd get, um, where I'd be getting out. Uh, but in the meantime, I want to make sure that I don't get you know, freak wick down that takes me out. So when I'm in a, in a very strong trend where the short-term trend is bullish, the medium-term trend is bullish, and the long-term trend is bullish, I don't need a stop loss because I can just scale out when the short-term trend turns, when the medium-term trends. Um, that That's how I like to do it. Whereas in the S&P right now, you've got a, a short-term trend that is not bullish. You've got a medium-term trend that's probably mediocre to neutral and a long-term trend that's still bullish, but time to be very, very careful. Uh, so let's see what happened today on gold. So this was the open today, I believe. Yep, right here. Just took off in a big way. We'll see how it closes. It's having a little bit of trouble. Uh, are getting a little bit of a wick up there as it comes off of... 1555, uh, but man, what a big move in just a couple hours. Thing moved almost 2%. Um, so that is certainly something to pay close attention to following, uh, kind of like I was saying in Bitcoin, in terms of you get these consolidation areas which cool down after. The price has made a big move, and therefore you expect continuation in the same direction as the preceding trend. Um, if this was down into this, we would expect it to continue down. Uh, since it's up into it, we expect it to continue upwards. Look at that spread in the DIs. That's big, big time, and that did provide a real good signal in terms of that happened before here. Um, so that's very, very interesting. And that's what, so like right here, you're at resistance and you're wondering, is this going to break through or just kind of be a fake breakout? And this is what you want to see to tell you that it's going to be a real breakout in terms of the buyers are very, very much in control. They're not slowing down at all and there's plenty of follow through. So that's uh, very interesting. And something that has been definitely worrying me, I think it may be, yeah, it's the weekly ADX is starting to get up there, but that's not near as worrisome as the RSI, which is at levels sort of unseen before. Um, so definitely keeping an eye on that. And let's go ahead and take a look at gold as it relates to Bitcoin. I wonder, is it XAU BTC or BTC X? XAU. Let's try that. Nope, didn't work. Uh, so we'll do XAU BTC. Really? Do we have to do divided by? Or 
to close that. I mean, does it matter? This should BTC divided by XAU, or maybe XAU USD. That's what it is. Sorry about this, guys. I didn't imagine I would have a problem pulling this up, but clearly I do. Uh, BTC USD XAU USD. There we go. Okay. And take a look at, um, since I'm kind of thinking that Bitcoin's most likely next move is to the downside, and it sure looks like gold's next move is to the upside, uh, maybe we can see something in this chart. And that actually is kind of interesting. Um, shoot, and somebody did point this out to me on Twitter. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your um, who it was at the moment. I would... Uh, give you a shout out if I could recall, but I've already been wasting a little bit too much time to go look right now. But this is definitely painting a pretty interesting picture. This sure looks much more like a descending triangle, um, and I would say that it qualifies. You see how it kind of tried to turn the corner here in that cupping kind of motion, but it failed to do so and broke down, created a new low, but closed a Above, and now we've got another lower high here, and this is a beautiful head and shoulders. I'm probably going to have to uh, send this chart out on Twitter. That'll be a little bit of fun. Uh, the pattern is definitely uh, suggesting what I'm seeing in the um, other charts in terms of uh, we would expect BTC XAU to be bearish if BTC USD is bearish and XAU USD is bullish, at least for the you know very short term. If that's if my short term outlook is correct, um, then this is kind of what I would want to see. And we do have shoulder, shoulder, head. Um, abbreviated right shoulder is kind of bonus points. Uh, Peter Brandt talks about the abbreviated right shoulders being the best head and shoulders. And what that means to me is that you get a lower high than the left shoulder and it also lasts for not as long. Like this lasted for, you know, say 10 days and then this lasts for maybe seven and has a lower high. That's the abbreviated shoulder, which is more bearish to me in terms of doesn't get back up to horizontal resistance, doesn't hold above horizontal support for as long. Um, so this is a pretty uh, ideal head and shoulders pattern for me. And then you do see the 50 EMA starting to roll over. Uh, let's go ahead um, and I would use this to measure the move just because it's a little bit more conservative. And since this didn't come down to the horizontal, let's take a look at that. 30%. Uh, so we would go something like 30%, which would be very interesting. That would be Bitcoin. This was where it was kind of at like 5,000 and this was about 6,000 support. Um, so on the Bitcoin USD chart, this is where it was when the price was around, we'll say like 58 or so. Um, but that doesn't mean that Bitcoin would have to go there by any means. Um, even if this does get here, it could do so by gold rallying and Bitcoin being flat. It could also do so by Bitcoin rallying and just not keeping up with gold. Um, so there's a number of ways where this ratio could get back down in here, uh, but that is definitely an interesting picture that it's painting with that um, descending triangle target and then uh, the head and shoulders target would also be somewhere right in here. So potentially a return to retest um, five for the ratio of Bitcoin to XAU, something to pay attention to. And um, really that, that would be almost perfect for me being long gold and now short Bitcoin, um, I am set up to basically take advantage of this chart. So say that you, you're you seeing this chart and you're like, well, shoot, I don't have any market to trade uh, Bitcoin against uh, gold. Well, what you can do is start thinking about um, you know hedging and, and that sort of thing where you're like, okay, I'm going to uh, this 
tells me that Bitcoin should lose value against gold. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, I have X and I'm going to put 0.4X um, long Bitcoin and 0.6X into long gold. And if I'm right and this and uh, Bitcoin does lose value against gold, um, then you know, you're going to be able to show some sort of profit. Um, I, I haven't thought out that exact position all, all the way through, but I'm just giving you an idea for potentially how to think about things in terms of uh, maybe it's going short Bitcoin and going long gold. Um, you know, so, thinking something along those lines is there, there should be ways to capitalize on this chart outside of just um, trading the, the Bitcoin uh, gold ratio. Uh, so we are starting to get close to an hour and close to time to analyze the weekly close. Uh, but I do, I am interested to see the gold versus um, silver ratio because that was kind of taken off to new all time highs. Did anything happen since I last looked? Sure enough. So that tells me silver must have made a huge move, huh? Interesting. Uh, let's put this on the weekly. It's amazing. Came back to retest that 50. That looks like a very important boundary. Um, we can see that this has been trending hard and is maybe starting to accelerate off of that trend line. And when I see that, that's when I'm interested in looking at a more of a curve. Interesting. So that did have a big correction, but all that it's really done is come back, so far anyways, is come back to retest this horizontal. If we're able to get some sort of double bottom or higher low here, then this could definitely continue back to the upside. And let's see what silver is looking like. It's still has moving averages in a bear market, which makes me think that um, that chart should continue to the upside. Uh, so this is definitely interesting. We had this descending triangle that I was looking at. We did take out this horizontal. Now we're testing this horizontal. So it does look like a good spot for gold to regain value against silver as silver's at resistance and it may, would make a lot of sense for it to pull back down to 1612 or so. Um, and let's see what the moving averages are telling us. I think they're gonna say the same thing. Yep, sure enough. So price above moving averages with the golden cross, that's a sell signal. Um, that's you know not one that I'd be taking here, uh, but it is telling me that I, I don't want to be entering this market just yet. Um, basically, if the sell signal fails and this actually is a buying opportunity, what we want is for maybe, cons let's see here, oh. is potentially like a consolidation below this horizontal, maybe forms a bull flag while the moving averages roll up and get a golden cross that would be an ideal entry. Um, I'm generally looking at the four hour chart for these EMAs, but when I'm looking for major reversals from long-term bear trends, I'm looking at the, the weekly 50 and 200 EMAs as my final confirmation. So here would be one way uh, to get a really, really nice entry. Another would be to potentially, you know, kind of continue on to the upside and then pull back and into the golden cross happening there. So I'll be paying very close attention for some entries into silver coming up. This definitely is looking very interesting from a long perspective, uh, especially if we can get that golden cross and then get back above 1850 or so. Um, there, there will be definitely some opportunity to be had in this market if we can stay above this 200 EMA long enough to get a golden cross here. Until then, I'm not expecting it to happen. Um, it, it might, it might not. All right, Bitcoin weekly close time. What do we got? What do we got? Three minutes? What do we got on the action that we have been watching? That 
looks like a strong close, but it doesn't look like it wants to get back above that key horizontal that I am looking at, and it might. I mean, just two minutes uh, is more than enough time to get back above there, and that would be quite strong indeed. So this is fun to watch in real time. I definitely, um, when it gets, like I said, within a couple hours of the weekly close, it's time to pay very close attention uh, to see uh, often you'll see this come right up here to resistance. You'll maybe be watching the order book with huge orders getting filled, and then as soon as it closes, it reverses to the other side. That, that's what I would want to see for my position. Um, if we do close above this line at 10, 1, 4, 3, uh, then I would be watching for follow-through um, from the bullish perspective. So definitely watching 10, 1, 4, 7, 1, 4, 3, we'll call it. And something that I definitely will do, let's go ahead and take a look, is just kind of pull up the order book to see if we can get any glimpse there. As soon as the candle does close here in two minutes, I'll pull up that chart to analyze. In the meantime, um, let's just look at, it's kind of like looking at the order book to get a feel for how many orders are here to sell, how many orders are here to buy, how big are these, like right there, $500,000 order to sell, um, that's big. Um, you know, that's very significant. So trying to, the market will move fast, especially around the close. And that's why I like to follow it at this time. Because when it's not moving, it's, it's boring as heck to watch. But right now, just kind of keeping my eye on how big are the buys, how big are the sells, um, how ferocious are the sells. Like, is there just going to be a pounding sell volume coming in right around this close? Um, is this support real? Is it is it staying there and taking up all the sell orders, or is this just a, a whale playing games? Is just waiting to move? Like that's an enormous order of 5.5 million. Um, that is something that is uh, almost. I, I always think of this as like a poker player, and I think of this as people playing games in terms of if somebody's throwing up a five million dollar order here below a million dollar order here. This guy is probably wanting to fake you out. He's probably bluffing. He probably has no intention of filling that. And if that's the case, why would that be the case? Why would he want to bluff you there? The only reason he would do that is if he was very interested in selling. Um, if he had a, you know, he really wanted to get out and he was having trouble getting out because the market's kind of moving away from him. So he comes in and he puts in these fake orders to act as support, which may help him to kind of get out of some positions. So that's where I will be kind of thinking about uh, this type of thing as I'm watching the, day, uh, the daily and weekly closes. Um, so here we do see that it closed below that boundary on the four hour, but we have immediately reacted to the upside. So now I'm watching for if we can take out this peak of this wick that is follow through and that is telling me that bulls are taking control. And if they um, are maintaining control for the next few hours, that's telling me that I should expect this uh, resistance to be broken at 10,500. And pulling up the weekly chart. So what do we have here? This is an inside bar. Um, there just really isn't a whole lot uh, to analyze with the candlesticks in terms of this has been a choppy mess. We're waiting for a trend to happen and when you're in chop the candles don't really help a whole lot. Um, you, you know you're gonna get inside bars and, and hammers and hanging men and spinning tops and it just isn't gonna mean a lot. What When it means a lot is when it's following a big move. Like this meant all the world to me. There's nothing more important to me at this time than this candle uh, because it was a, an enormous reversal candle after an enormous move. Here, we just got an inside bar after consolidation. Who gives a shit um, is kind of how I think about it. Uh, but let's go ahead and take a look at the trend line just to make sure we didn't get any sort of unexpected move back up inside there. Um, and that was what I found so interesting about this weekly candle is how it threw back to perfectly um, break down this trend line. So I kind of started uh, the show with some uh, maybe a little bit bullish perspective in terms of looking at the symmetrical triangle and just saying we should expect it to break in the direction of the preceding trend. Um, and I haven't 
really explain exactly why I'm not expecting that to happen right now, and we can go through that real quickly. There's just a, a few uh, main reasons. First of all is breaking down this trend line that occurred here, close below the trend line, and a throwback to retest it for resistance. That tells me um, that this was the trend, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows. Now we got a lower high right here, and now the trend is going to either continue to the sideways or have a, a correction. Um, breaking a trend line tells me that a correction is on the horizon um, or a full on reversal. So we've got a broken trend line, a throwback to retest, what I am viewing as a lower high, and now we've got a Bill Williams fractal on this lower high um, after this just closed. Let's just make sure that I'm not crazy. Sure enough. Um, so here we go, lower high from here. Um, the first time after bouncing off of this trend line that it didn't lead to a higher high. Okay. And then what else do we have is the violated parabolic SAR here. So parabolic SAR is bearish. Um, when that happened, I was waiting for the trend line to kind of break and as confirmation for the SARS that this wasn't just going to be a, a little like one to two candle kind of correction where we then take off again hard to the upside. Um, so that hasn't happened. So trend line, SAR, and then um, four hour 50 and 200 EMAs, death cross, and then resistance here. And finally, daily Ichimoku cloud is bearish now, bearish Kumo twist, bearish TK cross, price below cloud. Here's the lagging span. I don't pay too much attention to it. Maybe I should, but uh, daily cloud is now bearish for the first time this year. And those are the primary reasons why I am not expecting this to go ahead and continue to the upside. And I am, um, am more expecting it to uh, continue, or I mean, correct back to the downside. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at some Henkanashi candles. Maybe that'll give us a little bit more information that the normal candles aren't. Uh, so let's see what we got here. Not seeing, uh, well, I mean, it, it is interesting. This is painting a, showing that we could be starting a new trend potentially, um, kind of getting our reversal candle here. And then what I look for is that this has no wick on top. Um, seeing that this, and this literally, I mean, just opened, right? Um, so it will be very easy for this to change um, here very, very soon. Um, but just to kind of keep an eye on in terms of we did get a, a kind of a reversal here, and then we did get um, another red candle here that closed lower, and now we've got this candle with no wick on top. Um, if we can do that, if we can close below this close with no wick on top, that would be a very a good indicator. Well, I can't say very good indicator. I haven't been following these for long enough, but it would be an interesting indicator for uh, the start of a new trend. Um, and just kind of notice, let's take a look back in here. Um, we've got, you know, kind of wicks on both sides, wicks on both sides. Now we start to make a move, reversal candle, and now we get that action where it's um, no bottom wick, and then that's what you look for. That bottom wick does kind of start to show uh, the first sign of an exhaustion. Um, as long as there's no bottom wick, it is a very strong trend. And then once you get those wicks to kind of come in below the candle in a bullish trend, you start paying attention for reversal, specifically when you get this spinning top type of pattern. Um, so that is what we're seeing on the HA candles. Um, not a whole lot to analyze just from a candle perspective. 
um, but definitely something that I'm going to be paying very close attention to the price action over these next couple hours. This is quite bullish. Um, absolutely. Here we go. And as that's happening, I'm going to be signing off here very soon. But let's just go ahead and take one last look at the order book to see um, how the action is going. Again, I just, I, I just think of this as a fight, as kind of a... Uh, a heavyweight boxing fight and just watching the the red versus the green kind of it's like watching a fight and, and who's winning and right there I was seeing that the Bulls are winning so I'm just kind of wanting to come in here and seeing how badly are the Bears getting beat up is there just tons of support and no resistance and huge buying orders coming in uh, that's that's what I like to keep my eye on but if this reverses from here that is the trap that I have been talking about where it, it comes really um, strong into the close, like the three hours come in really strong and even really threaten a boundary getting taken out. But if for the next couple hours following that close, if that doesn't follow through, then very, very much watch out for that reaction um, in the opposite direction. Uh, so hopefully that isn't too complicated or too much... Um, uh, rambling about uh, all sorts of different things. I mean, shoot, we went over a whole bunch of different things and just reminded me that there are, um, there was one other thing that I wanted to cover before I sign off and go uh, wish my mom a happy Sunday. And let's take a look at this tweet here from uh, Dr. Bitcoin MD. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Hal Finney calculated a potential for $10 million per Bitcoin uh, one week after the Genesis block on January 3rd, 2009. Now, this is freaking crazy. I mean, absolutely unbelievable. Um, what foresight. One week after Bitcoin was released, uh, this is the level that Hal Finney's thinking on. I mean, that sure makes you wonder uh, how closely connected Hal Finney could be with Satoshi. I mean, who is thinking on this level one week after Bitcoin? And why I'm so um, interested in that is because of an article that my former partners, uh, Tyler Jenks and Leah Wald, published on Medium. And that's this long and winding road to a $10 million Bitcoin. Um, and they, so I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. Let's look at his post. Um, he says that really hard to give these any sort of valuation um, but here's an amusing thought experiment imagine that bitcoin is successful and becomes a dominant payment system in use throughout the world then the total value of the currency should be equal to the total value of all the wealth in the world most people kind of understand that now um, current estimates of the total worldwide household wealth that i have found range from 100 trillion to 300 trillion with 20 million coins that gives each coin a value of about 10 million unbelievable that uh, Tyler and Leah came to the exact same conclusion all these years later and here they do have a number of sources for the all of the money in the world we're talking total sovereign wealth funds and currencies um, you know debt uh, gold uh, um, we're looking at uh, here if we add up all the money in the world which it's you know very time consuming to go through and get all these stats, but once you have that, it's a pretty simple formula. You just add it all up and divide by the number of Bitcoin and then come to how much um, could a Bitcoin be worth. And uh, if Bitcoin does take over as a global reserve currency, which I do believe will happen, if not in my lifetime, then in the next generation, um, then um, it is very interesting to see that uh, not only did Tyler come to a uh, valuation of $10 million per Bitcoin, but also did Hal Finney, and he did it a week after the Genesis block. I mean, that is um, mind-blowing to me. Uh, so was there anything else that I had written down? Nope. That is it. And I appreciate everybody who has uh, stuck with me. This is a little bit of a longer episode, but I think there's a lot in there. Um, probably we'll be doing a little bit more of order book watching uh, moving forward. I think that there is 
definitely an edge to be found um, by those who are willing to watch the order book on a regular basis. And really what it comes down to for me is if you watch it on a regular enough basis, you intuitively, you instinctively start to pick up on shifts and of changes. And um, that's when you start to notice that, oh, at certain times a day, weird things start to happen. And um, I think it can be a really good idea to um, watch that order book on a regular basis if you do have the time and you're sitting in front of your, of your computer. Um, so again, thank you all for uh, sticking with me uh, through a long episode. For those of you who did, for everyone who um, tuned out a little early, I think you missed some good stuff. So uh, let's pay close attention to this price action over the next couple hours just to see um, if there is follow through from the bulls. If there isn't, then um, I will be watching for that trend line to break down. If there is, I'm going to be um, very much looking for where I want to be getting out of my shorts. Um, so definitely stay tuned for tomorrow's episode. I will be uh, coming back with the uh, regular show tomorrow afternoon and um, we'll still be trying to figure out if I can figure out this live streaming until then I haven't really had too much of an issue with the um, pre-recording um, I've been getting great comments uh, afterwards on YouTube and have been getting them uploaded in time to where they're still you know plenty plenty relevant so again thank you all for tuning in this has been Socrates streams I will plan on catching up with you tomorrow